It is a great honor and a privilege to introduce Yitzhak von Schweitzer. Your, you were born as Helmut von Schweitzer and we in your beautiful apartment here in Edgeway in, in London. But you also spent time in Johannesburg. But you're originally from Austria. So if you could tell us a little bit of, about your family history. And um, I'm just so extremely grateful to you for this opportunity to meet you and to hear your most remarkable, incredible story. Yeah, uh, <coughs> I, I, my life is full of big surprises. When I was born on the 14th of May 1926, <coughs> I was named Helmut Alfred Karl Maria von Schweitzer. And uh, then I was christened, and that is the christening party, which took place a few days later. And, and I'm of course in my mother's lap, and my older brother, Gottfried, is there with my dad, but unfortunately he didn't survive more than one year after I was born. He, there so was an accident. I, I became the eldest by default. He, there was an accident. It was an accident. Um, you know, in, in that area, <coughs> water was very short. Um, <coughs> it was highland, you know, above the, the river Danube. But <coughs> the, the rainfall was not, not, not sufficient. So it, the, the habits of the village, including the Schweitzer families, to have big containers under all the, where the water came down from the roof, um, and that water would be used for, for the kitchen and for the uh, washing, washing and bathing and that kind, kind of thing, so that the drinking water which was often scarce, was only used for actually drinking. For and, the people. And you, talk, you, you, were, you were born into a very aristocratic family. It was. And it has a picture of the... It was aristocratic family, but it was founded by an Italian uh, in um, newcomer to Frankfurt on Main, one of the main German cities, um, from, he came from Verona, Verona, and his name was um, Fran Francis, Francisco, Fran Swicaria, Swicaria, which was for, for the Germans a very difficult one to to take. So in order to assimilate and 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 acclim acclimatize sort of, to the city of Frankfurt, who was also not particularly fond of these Itali Italians, um, he sort of manipulated the name to Schweitzer. Schweitzer was something that is. Germans in, in, in Frankfurt would recognize and respect because Swiss, the Swiss were a respected part of the German-speaking world. And Yitzhak, the, the home that you had, the Schloss, yeah. in which, which, which town was it? Well, in Kreisendorf. And your father was the mayor as well? Yeah, it, because it was the biggest farm um, of the... Of, of, of the village and uh, and the Schweizers had in fact uh, um, sponsored the building of a church in Neixendorf and so on. I mean, they had been the, the sort of definitely contributing to the build up of the, and the growth of the village in a, in, a, in a very practical way, not just my dad. But his father before him. And the mansion that you stayed in, 
Do you recall growing up in that mansion? Yes, I do. It was originally built by um, monks that uh, the monks from from various German monasteries in previous centuries had penetrated um, because Vienna was in those days isolated from from the real German part and we were all kind of Slavish and Turkish, particularly Turkish uh, invaders uh, busy in, the, in that area, area. So the Schloss Kneixendorf was built by the monks for their own inhabitation and therefore it had its own peculiar sort of setup which the Schweizers adapted to their own uses afterwards. But they had to add a complete new modern kitchen area because what, 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 what there was before just was not good enough for the 19th century. But a uh, hundred years before, you have a connection with Beethoven in, in, in the Schloss. Yeah, well, that was, of course, originally, um, uh, it was, Beethoven had a younger brother <coughs> who was in, in business. And his, his business, particularly during the war, he was supplying the various armies, the Royal Austrian, Italian, um, uh, French armies who were crossing the area. Um, he was supplying them with medical equipment and and uh, anything from barges, anything to help the, with the wounded um, and so on. And became rich in the process. And then he bought the Schloss Knaxendorf, which was really a monastery before that, a given up monastery. This was Johann? But Johann um, Beethoven. So Johann Beethoven bought, bought it, and then of course he invited his elder brother from Vienna to come and stay with him. But by that time, um, uh, composer Beethoven was already, uh, could not hear anymore. He lost, lost his hearing. So every communication had to be in writing. Pieces of paper passed around. And I think and Ludwig, he composed uh, one of his last uh, compositions. Uh, but in the meantime, um, um, you know, uh, um, <coughs> Um, the young Beethoven um, had sold the, the castle and um, my, I think his great-grandfather who was treasurer of the empire of the Austrian empire found, heard about it and he bought the, 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 the property and passed it on to his only daughter and that only daughter, his only daughter married my great-grandfather and that is how Schloss Klaxendorf became a Schweizer property. And um, but, uh, don't think... We have a, an, a, ma a magnificent picture of your, your mother. Yeah. And this is an original. That's an original pa painting. I mean, I mean, she, her father was a professional Austrian officer, all, all of course in the, in the cavalry, you know, gentlemen were all in the cavalry, not, nothing else. And um, he, um, and, uh, so, but again, you know, um, he, she was a brilliant girl and uh, and the, 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 the father was stationed for a time in Prague, in Prague and now Czechoslovakia, but then boom, Bohemia and Austria. And <coughs> he organized that she would be going to the high school, to a 
high school that had a ladies part through it at Prague University. She was the first girl in her family to graduate uh, uh, from high school. And um, my stepmother, who came from Germany, uh, was also the first girl in her family to graduate from high school from high school because before that girls I mean to going to school at all was a problem and to high school you know, that was quite exceptional it's like you have a picture in your book of um, Mutti yes and um, your, your uh, with your father and uh, and then you are on the table, and um, yeah. and your sister, baby Rossi, when she was born. But your sister, when she was born. She was born uh, 18 months after me, in 1927, June 1927. And do you remember the night that your mother was ill and your father too? Yes, very, very. That was but the first, one of the first few memories that I always had kept active in my, my mind. You know, there are a lot of other memories that I kind of rediscovered later from pictures or stories or so on. But as a four-year-old, you know, there is not much that you clearly remember. But that night, being led to, to their bedroom and uh, she kissing me and Nobody said a word, and then I was. My dad took me back to my bed, but it stayed with my mind forever. And she passed away soon. It could have been that night. Yeah. Well, as far as I can make out, she died probably about a week or ten days later. And you never saw her again after that night. No, my dad was absolute. That was one of his things that. Children and death, there was no connect. There must be no connection. I mean, we never officially learned of her death at all. She just somehow one day wasn't there anymore. But I mean, we had maids looking after the babies and children, you know, in, in, a, in a big sort of formidable house, household. The mother wasn't constantly around the babies. Did you ever ask your father what happened to your mother or...? Well, I gradually found out, but it was a sensitive, sensitive subject because he was very adamant that we children should be kept away from anything to do with this. And when I think you had a maid that spoke or taught you a little bit of English? What? You had one of the maids that was fluent in English. Yeah, and taught it, it was, it was um, a nursery maid that um, my grandmother, my ex-Swedish grandmother, hired from London. She was an educated girl from London. And she brought up my dad and his elder brother and his elder sister. So they were brought up in a very English climate, and uh, I mean, I knew, um, and I only then, as children, you know, she then married the constructor of a, of a tennis court that was built on the on the on the on the estate, which I never experienced in my life because by that time it had been all t torn down and turned into flower, not flower beds, vegetable beds because of the economic conditions. And uh, Yitzhak, the area of the Schloss yeah. nearby, there was a Jewish cemetery in, in Krems. Yeah. Do you remember ever walking or yes. seeing? Yes, I, I think I, I'm writing about it in the book. It is one of my various explorations. It was well outside Krems, um, but on one of the 
there were these Roman roads, you know, which were, the Romans built their roads completely straight, no sort of curves or anything like, like that. And that was one of these maintained Roman roads, and it was about, I mean, it passed our particular estate about two, two, kilo, two kilometers west of us, going into the into the mountains, into the hills, yeah, and uh, we kids used to go around there. There was also in the same area a uh, public uh, what place where people were sent to test were hanged, and that that was also in the in the same area along that old Roman road, which was then used, it wasn't, became part of the actual road system, but for the farmers, it, it was, it was well, well used. There are no, no pictures. So you, you had, I mean, your estate that you stayed in, you even had a family guest book. Oh, yes. And people would, um, Initial in names inside. That's right. I've got it somewhere there. So you took your mother was gr a Greta. Yeah. And your mother, um, she befriended a Jewish woman, yeah. ba Baby Schmidt. Yeah. Carry on talking. Well, <clears throat> that was part of the, you know, uh, of the circle of. You know, it, it, there was a kind of circle of, of friends around. And the Schmitz were, were part of it. And, you know, you used to visit each other. Um, and your mother once read a book called The False God by Theodore Fritsch. Yeah, yeah. And it was a very anti-Semitic book. Yeah. And she and didn't she, agree. Yeah, that's right. She, she wrote... I mean, these are the things that we kids, my, particularly my schwester, sister Rosemary and I were sort of finding afterwards because neither of my parents were actually sort of spreading out what they, their personal diaries and letters that was their secret. The only access we would have was once they died. <clears throat> and that is why surviving all my parents and, and, and brothers and sisters, I inherited so much material because I was the leading survivor. And you know, it, it was an amazing experience. It's and I think baby from, sh from those letters and things that's how you found out a lot a lot of what was going I, on I about didn't Schmidt. I mean some of it I may may have heard about before but not until I got all the material and I don't think I've ever managed to read all of it and I think baby Schmidt she gave your sister a doll a dark the doll, black doll. Yeah. the black, black doll. doll, yeah, which uh, had which of course which was a caused very a lot of upheaval and upset for my poor sister when it was um, quickly dispatched by my dad before we reached the German frontier. So y your father remarried. Yeah, he, re he remarried when after my mother died, and. Um, he, he went to his cousin, you know, part of the Swedish family, who'd moved to Germany. And she was a fairly leading person in the German system of, uh, you know, women's education. You know, she was a, you know, a sort of inspired leader. Whether she was a real Nazi or not, I'm not sure, but uh, she, you know, <coughs> and um, Ulla was 
their favorite pupil or student or gradu graduate. And uh, that's how Dad, who came, they all met in Hanover at one of those big industrial ex ex or ex exhibitions. And that's when my, obviously my mother had just died. And the, the two, I mean, her father just virtually committed suicide to, to that his daughter would marry this funny Austrian guy, you know, you know the, the Prussian Germans didn't have a very great opinion of these Austrians, you know. And of course then... Um, and he had three children. Yes. And he had three children. And, so. and, and three children. So I mean, here's a picture that from 1938 of uh, your, your stepmother and it's um and you in the so picture. she was, was she very kind to you your oh, she was wonderful and tell that, about the book tell about the the hans christian anderson book um, yeah, hans christian anderson book your dad came and told you that he was getting married yes and you yeah, and i had you know, I was in a, I don't know, how old was I? I don't know. Anyway, fairy tales were my my main book interest in those days. And when Dad suddenly said this evening, and um, I'm going to marry Ulla Röpke from Ger Germany, I uh, jumped up and handed him the book and said, give her that uh, from us children. So he took it to her and obviously she was quite impressed of, of this present. And I afterwards thought to myself, how could I possibly give up my favorite fairy tale book on the spur of the moment? But then? Moment. But then she sent one back to you. Yeah. But then she sent one back to you. She sent one. You know, every fairy tale had a big colour picture. You know, it was so heavy that um, my poor aunt Tiller, who used to read us these fairy tales, could hardly hold it. Mm. That's the new one that she sent over to you. She sent over. So, mm. so she was that very was my good to them. fairy tale life. But then... And they had more children. Then, Yes, another three. Another three, and did she did she show favoritism to the to her Never. children? Never. She no. treated you all equally. Definitely, yeah. definitely, De definitely. I saw that even as you know as I was around. That's wonderful. <clears throat> you can see she seems a very, very special no, she, lady. She was. She was. She was the one. Any priests. You know, Roman Catholic, uh, Protestant, uh, Jewish, whatever it was, she would immediately go up to them and start talking to them. My dad just didn't know how to, how to deal with his priests and things like that. She was doing it all the time. And you said, do you remember in 1935 when I think there were hard times and you had to sell the yeah. Schloss and then yeah. move to, to Germany? Yeah. Do you remember going on the train and the whole incident yeah, with the doll? It was a great experience for for me. But I mean, that scene when my pet, uh, first my my stepmother was trying to persuade Rosie to give up that black baby that uh, had been given to her by this lady. Schmitz. Schmitz. <coughs> and. Uh, you know, which they knew that uh, in Germany would be treated as virtually a, you know, how can you have a child with a black baby, you know, doll? So Dad subscribed it and put it away. And, uh, but that, that was one of, one of the big upsets for my sister. She never, she never really forgave him for that. 
See, for some reason, I don't know how and why, that baby doll, the baby doll, meant everything to her. She never married in the end. She became a very famous uh, political Professor. scientist, but uh, she, she never she married. She never got married. No. no. And at that time, I would have guessed that she was the one who would have a big family. But she she got completely professional. Mm. And going to Germany, do you remember leaving the uh, the Schloss, leaving the the mansion? Yeah. Was it difficult to leave? Well, as far as I'm concerned, to have to go for a huge train journey and so on. That was very exciting. I was very... I, I didn't mind. I was all, all... all interested for what happened. And it, it turned out very interest, interested because we then were for quite a few months at the huge um, railways... Uh, um, uh, hospital, which was a, a big hospital on top of a hill the in the woods in, in central Germ Germany where Ola Mutter's dad uh, was, um, which he'd organized from the start. He, he had come from Poland. He was a big know, doctor, well, tuberculosis he, he doctor. Was, he was then the leading lung surgeon. In, in in Germany, he never he never had any time for Hitler or anything. Else. He was one of the few pe people who openly said, "Don't want to know anything about him." And at this time, I think you were nine years old. Y yes. Do you remember, or did you know anything about Nazi Germany or Hitler or what's going on? But well, later on, I got sight of Hitler when I was in the Hitler Youth and he came to visit the big city near our new farm and we had to line the road uh, for them in all their Mercedes cars coming into town. Always, all the city boys always had, had all the central positions, but we from the country towns had to do or cover the approach, so to speak. And it's like, how was when you saw him? Because he was a very imposing personality. But when you saw Hitler, you were very close up. I think. If yeah. You obviously, he, his his car went about three meters past us, um, in front front of us, and we were sort of forming an unofficial cha chain, but there weren't, well, Kassel wasn't a particularly uh, favourite city of, of, I think Hitler probably only one who came there once. I mean, it wasn't like Nuremberg or Munich or even Berlin. Um, so uh, the people there were not in the streets to the same extent. And how was your impression when you saw him? Well, he was a kind of stony figure. He stood there next to the next to the driver of the car, and he wasn't he wasn't looking at anybody. Uh, I mean, he stood to attention, um, and he just looked straight forward. So, so but I mean, to see like so, you know, suppose a leader. Uh, right in front of you was quite an experience. And when did you join the Hitler Youth? The you had oh, to join. You know, you to ten, join. Uh, ten years you were officially from 1936, which was when I was 14. No, 26 and 10. Uh, ten years old, you were 10. Yeah, as a kid. Um, I, I was simply told from the from the nearest town, I was the village Jungfolk leader. The boys from uh, ten ten to fourteen years old. 
I had no prior training or anything. <clears throat> Every Saturday we had our meetings. That's how it started. And we had to learn, you know, what to do. But this was the time when things were working up to the Olympic, the Olympic Games in, in, Germ in Germany. So here's a picture uh, of you. Just a minute. Yeah. And in your book, you have a, a very special picture. <clears throat> and you tell the story, you say that you would go from house to house and um, I think... Yeah, you had to collect, uh, collect money what was called winter help when 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 the help um you know basically collect on the, on saturdays and i went to a, luckily my parents or my new mother stepmother uh, arranged <coughs> that from the high school in in the countryside where the farm was, which was supposedly to be up to standard, general standard in Germany, but they weren't. In Wiesbaden, I had my a real sort of shock experience, that, but that was a first class high school, and that's where I caught up with the, 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 the best German standards, um, particularly in Latin. And, you know, I was, I was in sort of 13, 14 years old, and um, I was swatting and, and, and passed the exam. Mm. And your father in, here's a picture of your father in 37, when he was a... Uh, in the German Wehrmacht? Yeah. He, he was a captain in the reserve German army. And then your mother, in order... Hmm? Your, your mother you? started to work in... Um, for the minister, the SS minister of agriculture. Yeah, purely as a housekeeper. Do you remember his name? Well, yes, it's, it's in the book here. Yeah. Um, can I? You mean the book and you look at find the name if you want it. Okay. So Yitzhak, you had your your mother's family. Um, there was an uncle Hannes Kluger. Kluger, yes, he's, <coughs> he was my 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 actual mother's. Um, Great uncle. Uncle. But he had a factory and he had some workers. He had and some slave labourers. Huh? He had the well, They had the, sh the family, the Kluger family, uh, <coughs> had this huge uh, range of flax produce for flax dress material producing factories along the giant mountains part, the north part of Czechoslovakia. They had a, about six or seven big factories. So you went there? To, uh, dealing with the linen, linen, uh, you know. That was in the, in the Sudetenland? Sudetenland, So you went to yeah. the city? It was one of the biggest factory organizations in Czechoslovakia, when, you know, when Czechoslovakia was taken over by the German army. So you went to visit there? And I stayed there. I went there to school for the last three or four years yeah, you went of my high school. You went to visit the factory? That's yeah, I went, went to with, with him to visit the factory and that's where I saw the slave labour all the girls with the yellow stars on their back. 
And did you know that they were Jewish? Did you yeah, saw the? Yeah, I, I knew that much. And what was on their faces? Did you feel they were terrified or? Well, I mean, this girl suddenly sort of stood up and stared at me, and I said, stared back at her. She's a nice girl, um, but not a word spoken. And could you ask your mother or your stepmother, could you ask yeah. what was going on, or did you know yes. what was happening? Yeah, well, then of course they said, look, I mean, the poor Jews, I mean, they're in a, yeah, on a tough, tough thing. I mean, officially, you know, uh, you know, they've been saved and they've been made to work. Officially, of course, it was all for their benefits as well. But, I mean, it was a general uh, rumour that they were badly treated. But, I mean, obviously, the German authoritative system didn't allow any truth, you know, what they said officially. That's all they were saying. And um, Yitzhak, can I ask, when, um, when your mother worked for a, um, the Minister of Agriculture, yeah. do you remember being... She didn't the, work for the minister, she worked in the for, for, for his family, the they had an estate, and of course, she, you know, he, he and, and, and his wife, who was a relation of... Uh, my stepmother um, had to stay in Berlin. That's why um, Ulla Mutter sort of took over and ran that estate uh, of a uh, home for them. And I, I was there on a, I think on an Easter holiday, um, school holiday. <coughs> I didn't, I couldn't stay, I had to stay in a nearby village pub, but then the big man came from Berlin and um, made a big speech at the, over the Christmas, at the Easter table <coughs> um, about how they were going to sort out Russia and uh, get the Ukraine, Ukraine cleared up and would and all the German uh, people who didn't have farms could settle there. So then at the end of the war, of course, he was being arrested and he committed suicide. This was before, at the Nuremberg. This was, uh, before, before he got, uh, convicted. Got, 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 got convicted. So this was the agriculture minister, Herbert, Herbert, um, I don't know, is it Bucky? Bucky, Bucky. Herbert Bucky. Bucky. And do you remember him? Do you have that yes, memory? Yes, I, I remember him. You know, he, he was quite an imposing figure. But he, he I, all I re remember was that he grew up actually in the Ural Mountains, of some, some German settlement in the Ural Mountains originally. And when you were in his home, did you feel, um, did he speak about the Jews or did, was there any anti-Semitic? Uh... Well, it, it wasn't, a, 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 you didn't talk about the Jews, you know, it was something you, you didn't, you know. It was like, <clears throat> it's the same thing about the, 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 the terrible actual war experiences, I mean, you were forbidden as a soldier to talk about it anyway. But none of the soldiers really f felt that it was the right thing for them to talk about how, how things, how terrible things went on. I mean, that was just not dumb and polite society. And um, yes, sir, you rose up in the ranks in the Hitler Youth. But you rose up in the ranks and but you again, in. it was because all the other kids. Yeah, I was the younger, one of the youngest, and I was held back by a special Hitler order 
that because at my age, having reached a certain uh, advanced stage in the high school, I was supposed to be not to be called up um, until I, I passed my final uh, uh, exam. And that was one of the reasons why when the Waffen SS approached me to volunteer, that I did volunteer to them because I just, I felt I had to be in the war. I mean, all my friends had already been called up because of a year older than I was. So that, that was one more reason. And then I've, by that time too, it was clear to me that uh, the Waffen SS was a bad show, you know, particularly murderous and all that. And if I, as a youngster, could do something about it, I would do it. And, you know, that sounds like sort of madness. And, and it was, in a way. But by strange coincidence, I, I was, I suddenly find myself in a position where I could do just that. Because we'd been for a week or eight days fighting the Russians on the river order without any food, without any ammunition, and they, as far as artillery backing was concerned, there was one battery at the back from our side which would fire one salvo at dawn and another salvo at, at, at dusk. We were hammered by Russian artillery, well, 22 hours of the night, and the two hours from, usually from about 9 to 12, um, they would attack across the river with boats and finally even with a mobile tank just before we were being relieved. But I mean, we were, we were finished. I mean, no, no food. I mean, I had one Russian soldier that um, I've noticed was dead close to me. So I, although the Russian artillery never stopped, I crept out and he had some bread in his back. back so I, I had, I had a, a bout of, of bread f from him. But he, he, he was, uh, you know, he was a, a dead man. But, uh, you know, the, the, the actual war was a real killer. And this was in 1944, when you, when you joined? 1945 already. But you joined in 44, near the, in the middle of 44. Yeah, but and then training, again... Training, training and training and training. training. I mean, the Waffen SS had, you know, had, had sort of made big propaganda that they were a better army because they would only have so-called volunteers. Um, and I had volunteered at age 17. I had no legal right. I had no... Only... You could only volunteer at 18. The Waffen SS itself by then was so desperate to get some bodies in to keep up the show that they were that they were a proper army training their soldiers. So what did they do with us youngsters? They 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 then had some some of them were Polish youngsters. Um, anything. To, for them to keep the show continuing, that they were having a succession of new Waffen SS people. And Yitzhak, I think one of the reasons why and you so also. It was only in, in June 1945 that I actually had my front experience, just, just outside Berlin, if you like. But mm. one of the reasons why you also volunteered is when you would go outside, a lot of people would say, what are you doing here? Why aren't you on the front? Yeah, of course. You felt a lot of pressure that you were yeah, one of the there only... Was, yeah. There was a lot of pressure. But I mean, I had my own... I wanted to find out whether... I, I, how I would react to be under fire on that kind of thing. 
you know, as a young typical. You want to find out can can you take it or are you going to? And, and of course, I, I learned to, I learned to take it. And your sister, she also joined the the uh, Hitler Youth. She was also yeah. She was she was a uh, same same thing as I. She was a local village girls leader automatically, and and. and uh, she she was in, you know, when when the war got really bad, she was in charge of a camp of kids who had been re- removed from Castle, which was the nearest big city, into a kind of uh, home in a, next to the villages. Uh, and anyway, she, she was in charge of of that, so. She, <clears throat> right up to the end of the war, but then, then everything was sort of dissolved, and people. She ran, she ran home. Yeah, but but I think what you're trying to get at here is that you d- you didn't have an option. You you were forced. You had to be in the Hitler Youth. <laughs> yeah. So oh yes. It wasn't something you could say like, oh well, I think I'll draw the Scouts or the <laughs> Girl Guides. But it, it was all that had, had un- to do it. All that had been abolished. Yeah, you know, you just had to do. It. You had to be in it. And when you joined the uh, the Waffen SS, yeah, I think one of the first places they sent you was to Riga to do. I know, but I mean, Riga was then under 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 threat by the Soviets already. So, I mean the. The, the, the local, the local defending forces didn't know what to do with us, so we were just left outside the station in Bulduri, actually, which is on the on the on the sea at the seaside, like the little seaside place, on a rail line to um, to the uh, to the long main port. Riga is not a port city, and we were there f- for weeks, just uh, swimming around and, uh, and in the sea, waiting. No uniforms, our civilian clothes going to port, you know. And I think they gave you weapons but, from from the First World War. Ah, that was only later, when we were back in West Germany, and you know. Being a, a a non-smoker, my cigarette ration was a kind of bargaining counter. So the quartermaster sergeant relied on my my tobacco or part of my tobacco thing, and I said I I need a bit. You know, even the training there wasn't a proper t- fighting training. It was a parades, 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 you know. So you were, you had to have an absolute clean gun. So I said to him, um, have you got a gun where I can be sure I'd never have a, a problem in, in these parades? He said, I think I have one. And that was a, a one from 19... What was it? A 1935 German army rifle that had passed through so many recruits and had been smeared on and polished so many times that all he needed to do was dust it off, and that was it, it, it was good good enough for the parade. So that, but with that gun, I um, I had a fairly easy time at these parades. And then the other thing, of course, is we, we didn't have enough food. And it was a kind of understanding that some of our parades would, or our exercises, would take us across across the border of the, 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 the field, the, the, the training area, into, into the farming area. So then we could dig up potatoes and turnips and so on, which we did, and cart them on. And the sergeants, and who, who were no officers, who, 
who did, they were in charge, allowed it to happen because, you know, they knew that we were starving. We were all starving. So, but then our particular training um, sergeant suddenly, you know, the guys had found all these potatoes and turnips, but he hadn't a clue how to find find the way back to to our, our barracks. So I said, I could show you. So I showed them the way back, and from then onwards, I had an easy time. You know, I was I was left alone. Mm. He and has such a uh, such a sense of of um, direction. It's that's yeah. very very good at finding his way anywhere. I mean, that's probably saved his life when you were, yeah. you know, when you were it's having to find the rest of the company. Yeah. And it's like when you were sent to try just outside Berlin, near the end of the war. Well, of course. I mean, by that time, um, I mean, all the civilians, f f most of the farmers, they're all on the, on the main roads. So as far as our particular, I, I mean, I found our, our, our major fairly quickly. I was sent as to find him. He, 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 it was fairly close to where we, we had come, come out from our fighting spell. And uh, then the whole, our whole squadron joined up in a town further back, further west, west. And from then onwards, our major was just in the background in case we were hitting on some some German you know, Waffen-SS or other people who were still continued, continuing to win the war. Uh, and, but we didn't then find any of those people anymore. Everybody was in some way or another trying to escape from the advancing Russians. Could you feel that the war was coming to an end? It, no, it was obvious. But, you know, you couldn't admit it and of course, you had to swear, had originally sworn an S, as a war oath that uh, you would defend with your life uh, the last or, or every last bit, inch of ground. You would, in other words, every every square foot, you would fight for your life, which of course by that time that didn't make sense sense anymore. But you know. The only safety, or of safety for the Greek, was to find find the American forces, surrender to them, which we did. And you led your your yeah. platoon in a way. You yeah. you said we should surrender. We we should we should leave. We well, should try to save us. I led them to 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 join up with our commander. Yeah, but before that, uh, before that, uh, before that. I led them to the artillery position, yeah, because which, the, which of course then told everybody that uh, the artillery had already disappeared. But because you you saw the you got you wake up early because of being on the farm, yeah, and so you woke up and you saw the Russians. That's what, and that's you that went and but nobody questioned whether what I saw were Russians. I was sure that they were Russians. And they were very close by you. They yeah. were right. so it was about a hundred meters down, down towards. And you could see them. Yeah, because it was just dawn in the morning. You know. He woke up, I, and all the other I, I, people were asleep. I, so they were running I mean, around to we'd, tell them. We'd only come to these places after midnight. You know, from having been on the front line, and I mean in our foxholes. On the front line, you you never got a proper sleep, eh? Because the Russian artillery was bombarding you day and night. Except then they stopped only when they were attacking. Oh, across across the river. So you, you were pretty f finished. But as a youngster, you somehow sort of still sort of 
had a bit of a life. And your decision to take uh, your comrades with you and to to surrender the position and to try to save yourselves, yeah. some that was a brave move because some would regard it as treasonous or. Oh yeah, yeah of course, yeah. of course. And I mean, a lot of, I mean, all these corporals and sergeants that were part of our fighting unit. I mean, they were very glad that I, this stupid youngster, took 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 a, a wild chance um, to to order, to give them an order to retreat away from the advancing Russians. And they listened to you, which well, is they listened to it, but they they were equally desperate. Only they didn't have the courage to to, to take responsibility. But he could have been shot for that. They, they could have been shot. I mean, I could have been sh shot, of course. But uh, uh, but being sergeants and having grown up in, in the Waffen SS and all the rest of it, they found it much harder to realize the truth mm. that was happening. And yes, I can ask you, and it's a difficult question, but I'm sure many people must have asked you. When you joined the Waffen SS, it was the Himmler's SS, did you know of the atrocities that they had committed against the Jews? Well, that's certainly not to the full extent. And of course, <coughs> you always, <coughs> because rumors were going around, <coughs> there were terrible c camps in Poland. I mean, most of these camps were, were in Poland, outside the main part of German, Germany. <coughs> And um, everything was done f by the Nazi party to keep the whole thing as secret as possible. So, you know, but you got individual people saying things are much worse than you can possibly expect. But, uh, you know, the actual real reality was even worse, wasn't it? And going back to that, that day when you made that in very bold decision, very, I mean, you're, you could have been shot. You really could have for yeah, could have been shot for for treason to yeah. to retreat. Yeah. When, um, but I mean, I had a feeling that uh, our people, particularly we, uh, <coughs> having been virtually hammered to death on the front line for seven days, without any help or any support except for the auto artillery firing you know um, it, it was obvious that uh, the Russians were overwhelming overwhelming there and you retreated and you managed to get to the American side well you, what it was the only way out for us there was there wasn't anything else except of course so, considering surrendering to the Russians, which nobody, nobody, they, they felt that was like, you know, committing suicide. committing suicide. And when you did meet the Americans, how did they treat you when they... They said, fine, hello, go home, go home, you know. Give us your watches, give us your guns. <laughs> that, that was, I mean, the, the, the American front soldiers were just they wanted to get rid of all these, these, these German surrenders. They, 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 you know, they were still supposed to be advancing, or at least defending their positions at the River Elbe. The, the, the last thing they wanted to have crowds and crowds of German um, soldiers without any food or anything else. Um, so they, 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 they sh shipped us down in, in well, we, we got eventually to Hanover, um, and in Hanover, of course, you know, the, uh, the German trucks didn't have any petrol anymore, so they said, well, American trucks will take over, and so, so you know, you, you gradually found yourself in a prisoner of war camp, but at least it was an American 
prison of war camp and at least it was on the outskirts of Hanover and not Berlin or anywhere where the Russians were. And when did you meet the British? Well, all that part, northern Germany, was the British zone of the occupation. And the Americans obviously had advanced into it and they left at the end of summer 1914. Uh, 40, yes, yes. Uh, summer. And the British took over. And the Americans treated us, all of us, as potential war criminals. But the, American, the, the, the British treated us as captured soldiers. It's made a hell of a difference. So immediately I became an interpreter because my school English was uh, helpful and uh, we were sent out to c collect food and to, to, to run our own British camps. And then I found out, um, uh, you know, we were in a huge collection camp in Hanover then, about 500,000 German soldiers. And I found out at, at the headquarters, um, the, the German uh, helpers there were lost to Austrians. So I, I got in, t in touch with the headquarters side and said I was an Austrian, by birth anyway, and, um, um, and I could speak English. And immediately I was fetched up to the headquarters because they were desperately short of English-speaking Austrians. And I became the interpreter for the British commander of this huge camp who was a, a you know, the, he had been made a, I, I think he was a, a colonel by, but for, for that particular job, which was f almost a general, but not quite. And um, so I had a great chance there to improve my English and to look after the orderly room and, and that kind of thing. And funny enough, all this was happening on the grounds of a Belgian farmer whose home was just at the back of of the, the British head, headquarters. There was only a barbed wire between us. And he was desperate because they couldn't get any coal or anything like that. Uh, so we British would throw bags of coal across the barbed wire and uh, he would share food or drink with us. Um, but obviously only during the night when all the, the the British people were having their sleep. And when did you go to England? You were sent to well, do a bomb well, disposal to all, do all these with the mines. Five hundred thousand German prisoners were gradually shipped to England until of course only the person the, the Austrians were repatriated repatriated to Austria when Austria be became an independent con country again. I could have volunteered to Austria, but I didn't like the idea of going what was then by no, by then the Russian zone of occupation of Austria and my family was in Germany anyway. So I I was one of the, I remained as a German prisoner of war behind and eventually was shipped with the remaining Germans to Germany. What year was that? Well, it was sorry, it doesn't matter. October, really. October, nineteen fourteen. Okay. That's when you went. No, no, no. Oh, October. Sorry. Uh, um, sorry, I shouldn't have asked you. No, I've, I was of course then shipped to England. Anyway, and. It, I was never. I was only released then, when the German currency was converted. 
uh, to the Deutsche Mark, as it was called. And your your job in, in England was to try... Well, when, when we arrived in England, of course, it was already autumn, 1944, uh, 1944. In other words, the, the harvest was Fatigue. over. So... Could, so, do you remember being uh, when you left Germany and you went to England? Do you remember going on the voyage when you arrived in England? Yes, very much so. And were you happy that you were being sent to England? Well, I was certainly, you know, because from my family, um, England was always at some sort of special, special place, and. Um, we, we were shipped in at uh, um, in in Belgium on a on a on a, on a British mine 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 sweeper uh, sweeper that had been converted in a very rough way to transport prisoners of war. And, and what hap what is your recollections when you arrived in England? Well, it was about midnight. And um, it was, uh, uh, you know, not that port of London quite, but a port just before the port of Lon London. And um, it, we were, most of our people had been terribly seasick, particularly the ones who stayed inside inside the boat but we a few of us on top in in the in, in the facing the weather i was against the headmast um um we somehow did get seasick i mean we just went down to get some food and even even all the british guard people were seasick and so arriving at uh, at the port at London was like a, a wonderful thing and uh, I remember still coming up the steps to to the to fr from, fr from the boat there was a Tommy standing up there with a mug of tea for everybody, <laughs> which was a, a real treat. Mm. And this young Tommy with his mug of tea um, was just a, a kind of liberation. And then um, obviously we, we were put in a train, put in another camp, which had been a camp, the American, for the American uh, Air Force uh, had when they were bombarding G Germany and we were then kept there because the harvest had already had already been organized and you were issued and with a British uniform yeah with, with colored patches on, on it here's a picture from your book it's amazing because having been fought against the British yeah. and fought against the yeah, Allies, you actually became an ally. You became part of the British. Yeah. But yeah. It's, it's quite unbelievable. Yeah. That yeah. Well, it was a, a gradual process. But what the, 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 the British, I mean, the, the British Army oh, had, had taken responsibility for clearing the unexploded bombs which a lot of them had already been dropped by Germany in 1940 and 1941, 42, um, and now it was 1946, and still they were they were all earmarked as far as they were known about, and so the public and, and the press got into it and said it's impossible that these unexploded bombs are still still there. Mm -hmm. and, and and of course the British Army says we are still busy in in, in the Far East and British soldiers c can't we can't find the British soldiers to come back to do this so the, 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 
the temporary major of our the London squadron. Um, he was he was he was not a major, but I think he was just a lieutenant or, or something. But he was made a major to to, to clear the bomb disposal. He said, "What about these bloody pris uh, prisoners of war? Um, can't we can't we uh, have have them to 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 help clear up the the German bombs?" And of course, they said, "No, the Geneva Convention um, says that you know prisoners of war must not be led into any dangerous position." So he said, "Well, if I if I contact." These prisoners of war, and oh, make them an offer to to join us clearing up, um, and they volunteer. Isn't that? It doesn't that clear the the air? So the war office said, "I don't. We don't. don't they didn't want to know about it." But if it's volunteers, it's still okay. It's okay. But so then, Major Gibson had us around. And I was the interpreter, <laughs> and he said, he said how wonderful it would be um, if we were joining them, clearing all those messy bombs in, in, in London. We would be treated like British, British soldiers, except for pay, of, pay of course. Um, and, uh, you know, we could go out in the evening and, and into the city and all the rest of it. And... Um, but then he said to me, "You better make sure that you have a meeting with with the you, with your colleagues, and make sure that you you really do volunteer. vote and volunteer." So I had this meeting, and of course, the, the youngsters were all keen to to do what I wanted them to do anyway, to join us rather than be stuck behind barbed wire and all that stuff. And it was a very dangerous mission that you were doing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the bomb could well, detonated yeah. and you could have uh, been killed. You know, simply. so, um, in the end, I mean, all the, all the, all the more older and more experienced German guys, married people and so on, they didn't want to help the British. But I think, we, we had a vote, which was a, a kind of messy business, and I said, I think the majority is for joining. So I just went to the colonel and said, look, yeah, we volunteered. And as far as that was concerned, there was no more testimony. Uh, you know, everything was in preparing. And of course, most of these p German people, you know, were, the more senior non-commissioned officers were very happy to become truck drivers on the bomb disposal side because they, they had driving experience. Mm. Not in London, though, because at first, of course, they caused a quite a bit of accidents. You know. But imagine. so, uh, as an inter interpreter, uh, spend a fair time at uh, uh, at legal kind of uh, were there any very bad incidents where bombs went off or no, people not, were killed? Nothing ever. That's, that's nothing ever. Just amazing. That is really quite incredible. Mm. But you can imagine when a bomb comes right f from from a high flying plane, it hits into the ground, goes down. It's a very dangerous. Twenty or, uh, 20 or 30, thirty meters, and it doesn't explode. It's not very likely to explode. Uh, but there's still the danger. Yeah, there is the, well, there is, there's, there's, there's of course the Zünder, it's called in German, the, you know, the, the bomb itself, and then there's a screwed in, in detonator. Detonator. Mm. So, you know, the thing was, once that the bomb was unearthed, that that had to be unscrewed and moved out. Yeah. And that, as far as, the, the law at the time was concerned is only the colonel or his deputy could could do that. 
everything had to be cleared, police had to clear the area, private people had to move out of that place and then the colonel would come and unscrew the, the detonator and come out with it and the press would report it and so on. <laughs> but and by and large most of these guys who actually managed the digging out had already unscrewed it once and screwed it back before reporting. <laughs> it was like <laughs> so it you know, how long did this this how long did it last? What do you for, mean? For two years. For two years you mm. were in the in this position. Mm. But it's like when we look at the picture yeah. of you in the British um army uniform, yeah. you're smiling and you look happy. You actually look Yeah, I was. You were treated well. Of course. I mean the British people, you know, every time, you know, one of these bomb disposal situations happened, the place was cleared, um, the press would be around, um, um, the colonel would come. They were heroes. Yeah. They were heroes, they really yeah, were yeah, heroes. heroes. That time. And of course the press would take photographs and then it realized that half half the people of the company or squadron or, or unit that dug up were German prisoners for and half were British. and. Uh, so we, we became very popular and I, I remember we had then the idea that um, all prisoners of war should be invited to a British family for a Christmas party In, and, 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 and that, that worked in 1945 and in 1946 uh, there, there were more people for, for inviting us than there were prisoners of war left. Wow. And can I ask, were you in touch with your family back in Germany? Yes. Your father had we, survived we, the war? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. And all, all, all your family? Everyone. Everyone was okay. Yeah. Well, it and depends. In the wider family, not. Uh, you know, because my stepmother's lost two brothers and her younger sister lost her husband. And Yitzhak, can I just ask, when you were fighting near the end, yeah. and the end was coming and people knew that Germany was losing, did you question why, or did you know that trains were being used to transport Jews from Hungary instead of trying to defend the motherland? Mm -hmm. Did these questions ever occur well, to... I mean, I, I learned all that, of course, in Brussels, when I, as a prisoner of war, uh, interpreter, interpreter, having all the British papers and and also Swiss papers, Welt Weltwoche in Switzerland, I I I wondered actually, you know, I knew the German papers were lying, but I I wasn't quite sure to what extent the British papers were lying or telling uh, some real truths. There was the Swiss, the Swiss Weekly paper, which the Red Cross would send across to us in London, the Weltwoche, which is a, a, a like the Economist, um, and to me that was my rescue. I, what I reckoned, what the Weltwoche was saying, was a general truth. You know, the Germans were definitely uh, be, beyond beyond, you know, they, they'd been lying so desperately and then and that I knew about. But to what extent the British were exaggerating and, 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 and I, you know, I had to find out. And when you found out, and I'm sorry, it's a very difficult question to ask, but the horrors of the camps and the horrors of the Shire, hmm. of the Holocaust, it must have come as a, a tremendous, a tremendous shock. Yes. It certainly was, but by, I mean, by that time I was rescued because I had some English friends, not just the bomb disposal people, but the people outside, refugees from Germany, um, you know, f families uh, who had fled f from Germany, Jewish families, and that is my first Jewish contact too. 
Did you ever ask your family what their involvement was during the Shoah or the Holocaust or is it something that you felt you couldn't approach the subject? How do you mean? Your, your uncles or your, your immediate family from Austria, from Germany, could you ever speak y to them openly? Yes, I, 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 by then I mean I, I was quite honest with, with them but, and they had every sympathy with what I was reporting and saying. But being stuck in Germany, or you know, stuck in, in Germany, they had to be careful because um, even though Hitler was gone and had been replaced, the general feeling in Germany was Germany didn't, or the German people themselves didn't want to f really accept the guilt for that horror, you know, uh, it, it was just impossible for them to imagine. And they didn't want to know about it. In other words, if you weren't directly involved, you wanted to try and put it... Well, put you know, they said... It didn't happen. We, we, were, we were doing our best, having enough food to eat. Mm -hmm. We didn't know nothing. Mm. You know, okay, it was... To some extent, some extent it was an excuse and to some extent it was an accepting That's reality yeah. but it wasn't a full acceptance it was only um okay it's someone else's job but uh, it's a camera also and it's it's i know it's, it's an exceptionally difficult question did it, did you ever read or speak to german friends why put all the energies in trying to destroy the Jews and use all the railways instead of trying to use those railways to save our own people, to save they, the they, country. They, they, they would say, look, I think it was terrible. Um, you know, we didn't, we, we didn't know about it. We, didn't, uh, we weren't responsible. We would never have done it. But don't ask us to... to, to to come and, and go to Auschwitz and, 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 and look at the, at the place and, and really find out how terrible it was. You know, you know they, there was that kind of barrier. They mm. said, look, nobody can say that we were personally involved. Thank goodness for that. And, mm. and leave it at that. But, it just sort of it wasn't, wasn't good enough, really, yeah. because the whole thing didn't run away. In, mm. in fact, it became more and more of an indictment. Mm. But uh, I think, in some ways, people don't want to really think that something like that, or as bad as that, it, it could can, actually can possibly happen. Have. I mean. If, if you sort of think of it as um, I'm here, but then up the road somebody is being murdered or, you know, somebody's taking a knife to them, but it, I can't do anything about that, but it's, 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 you think in yourself it's terrible, but there's nothing you can do about it. It's, it's like when you hear about crime going on in a daily place, like in other words, you know, there's a lot of crime, let's say, in, in Croydon or somewhere. I'm here in Edgware. You can say to yourself, well, it's a terrible thing, and you can feel for those people, but there's nothing you can do about it. And I would imagine that's yeah, how yeah. this is to some of the German people, that, especially yeah. those living in villages, not in the big cities. Yeah. And Rivka, when you met uh, Yitzchak, how much at that time, how did your family react and how did you react? My mum said to me, first thing she said, you can't possibly go out with him, he fought for the wrong side. That was her exact words. Um, and I also was a bit wary at first and even in, occasionally scared of him. 
But then that all changed when I got to know him. And, you know, my mum also. Yeah. And your family accepted? Your family accepted? Yeah. yeah. And your friends and... Yeah, I don't think they... Because I never actually said to them he fought for the wrong side. I mean, my mum, obviously, I said, I told where he was from, but I don't think any friends, I told them. I was just, this is my boyfriend, and no, nothing else was was asked or said. And it's like you went to the London School, School of, of Economics. Economics? Yeah. Well, because having been, you know, I was bombed to disposal and um, got a f reasonable... Um, re reputation there, and I got f friendly with the head of um, the LSE when I did uh, uh, an entrance examination. Um, you know, um, I was giving, you know, I was treated as if I was a released British soldier and the least British soldiers had free access to the university. So I studied at the London School of Economics without paying any fees. And when did you get married? In what year? We've been married 56 years. Okay, don't worry, that's wonderful. Mm. And yeah. when did you decide to go to South Africa? I don't think it was like a decision. I think it just sort of just happened. Yeah. Again, it is a whole sequence of things. I mean, <clears throat> I... <clears throat> my, f my, f my, my first career in, in f f f paid work was with the John Lewis Company, John Lewis Partnership here in London. And they, they give me uh, uh, an outstanding chance. I started there as a porter at, uh, at John Lewis, the, the, bomb, the, the bomb shop uh, store in Oxford Street. Mm. And then it, um, I found out that it was the John Lewis partnership and all the head office people were in in outbuildings at the back of, the back of Oxford Street in those days. It was still kind of wartime uh, situation. And um, so I, I, I said, well, if it's partnership for all, here I am. I'm a, a new partner um, of... Uh, well, by that time I was managed to my first wife already. So I said, I'm a married Brit British man now. Oh, well, not, I, I'm not sure without my, no, I didn't have a British passport yet. I had to be three years as a married, married, married to a British girl to, before I, <clears throat> but um, I, I, I became an Austrian because Austria was an independent country and suddenly they had an embassy in, in London. I went along to them and I said, you know, I'm an Austrian. He said, well, great. Um, so can I have an Austrian passport? Yes, you've got to have a, a certificate from the, the village where you were born, from the Bürgermeister of the village where you were born, born um, and we'll give you a Austrian passport. And of course, so I wrote to the, the Austrian, my, my old, old village. I didn't, didn't know the guy, guy I'd never met. Him. But he, by a turn of post, the certificate came. And I, I got, suddenly had my Austrian passport. And then when, when you met, Mm -hmm. um, did you meet, when did you meet with, uh, with Yitzhak at that time, it was how uh, family? On our honeymoon. And you, you were already married? Yes. Did they, did On they our never, honeymoon. They, we never, came, they honeymoon. never came for their wedding? No, none of them. 
No, I'll cut my, my brother or so. Yeah, well, Peter, because Peter. he lived here. But no, none of them from overseas came. I, it was only, only his I brother. had the effect of bringing of the old one, on the, all the boys from the Schweizer Weiler family um, who had survived the war um, followed me to England. Yeah, and, Peter. And Richard, can I but, when you when met... When I first met them, I mean, the thing was that they had wanted Yitzhak to marry a friend of his sister's. So, you know, the fact that he was marrying me was a bit, um, really, they didn't want it. And I uh, also had the feeling that when we, had, when we actually converted, it was a point of, well, this wouldn't have happened if he'd been married to Maria. Mm. But uh, <laughs> should have married an Austrian, not, not me. But, but uh, were you eventually accepted? But they accepted me, yes. Oh, they yes. did. They did, yeah. And when, and then... Actually, I mean, we became... Then, particularly when we had our, our house in Cookham with, with the Toronto's partnership, um, <clears throat> we had a very nice ha house there on the on the on it, the Thames. It, on the big, big estate there, and uh, the, all the German family came over, you know, for an English holiday, mm -hmm. you know, from Ger from beaten Germany, you know. Mm -hmm. And when you came to South Africa, it was in the, in the 70s? Yes. Were you nervous coming to apartheid South Africa, or did you know no. what you were coming to? No. Do you remember? Yeah, I know that. I was working at the consulate's office. Pam was working at the consulate in Frankfurt. British consulates. Yeah, the British consulate. And so there was a leaving party for somebody else. Were you, were you living in Germany at the time? Yeah, we lived there for a couple of years. And we were living in um, near Stuttgart, a place called Mark Gröningen. Because <coughs> Yitzhak had a, a job there for ITT. I, he was working I, for I ITT. was working for a very, very American big American company. group that was expanding all over Europe. And I was covering as a kind of... German-speaking... I was covering the German-speaking countries. In other words, uh, uh, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. And you were mm. stationed near Stuttgart? Sorry? You were stationed near Stuttgart? Near Stuttgart, Mark Grunigan. Did you ever go to Falbach? I don't think so. It's a suburb of Stuttgart. Mm, I don't think so. It's an exhibition. What? And when did you come to South Africa? Do you remember why you came? Well, well that with, with ITT, um, that there was a, a job which meant that Yitzhak had to go to South Africa. And we, he's also had a family there in South West Africa. South, you know, South West Africa, I've been colony. being a German colony. And uh, my stepmother's family, a part of that, had um, settled in, in South West Africa. Were there many, many generations in, in, in those, it was German South West Africa? Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and, and that particular family were the only people who had a de department store in Windhoek. When I had been in the, in the John Lewis department stores as an experienced uh, operator for years, so, you know, um, they, they were they clean been, been for me to, to come, and we yeah. thought they've we been would begging. Too, they've we been would, begging him to we go. Would, we would spend a summer holiday there, which we did. We spent three months there. Yeah, two months. Three months. Yeah, in 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 winter. Yeah, in South but no, Africa. In, in South in South Africa and we've been to, between the two, we sort of were, were in South Africa, Joburg, and, and then we went down to Windhoek for about three weeks. And then came back again to Germany. And by that time, of course, I already had a, somebody trying to offer me a, a job based in in in, uh, in Joburg. In Joburg, which I took. Ron Ron Spies. Ron Spies, he was developed. He was a property, property developer, developer. B with particular emphasis emphasis on shopping centres. But, you know, my department store experience was sort of a, a factor 
Yeah. And we got on very, very well. Except, event, there was, again, even after the war, you had, um, what do you call it, uh, breakdowns of the economy and that kind of thing. And when was your first interaction with, with the Jewish community? Did you experience any when you always. were in England or...? We've always been mixed up with the Jewish people because I, I, I'm in the rag trade. And I think your mother was, was helped during the war years yes. with, with yeah. the Jewish friends? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but in the rag trade they're all Jews. Mm. So that's really how we were sort of, I was involved with the Jewish people was through the rag trade. And when you were in your first job here in London you also had Jewish, had you met Jewish neighbours yeah. or Jewish friends? Lots of them, lots of them. And you always got on well? Always. And you took you got on well as well? Mm. With the, I mean the Jewish John, John Lewis wasn't particularly Jew friendly although there were some some Jews in the company but you know you had to obviously work on Saturdays, no, no question about that. And when you got to Joburg, mm -hmm. how did you become involved with the Jewish community? Um, well, the way we ended up getting, I mean, in England I had tried to convert. You, when I was in England I tried to were convert. Were you already married? No, no, I wasn't, I was on my own then. Um, but I tried to convert and the, I went to a, a rabbi somewhere in Mile End Road or just off Mile End Road and it was read this, read that. That's not me. I'm a hands-on person, not a read person. Rivka, why did you want to convert? Ah, <sighs> I wasn't happy in my own body, if you like. You know, I'd tried, uh, I'd been brought up in the Leisha Mission um, I'd been to uh, Catholic churches, I'd been to um, Methodists. I couldn't find myself. And obviously it was because I'm half Jewish anyway, but I didn't know that. Um, only when we did this DNA thing did I find that out. But so I had tried over here, but then in South Africa, um, we had a lot of Jewish friends, and the kids obviously had Jewish friends. And all the businesses that we were working for were uh, Jewish-owned business. Yeah. Um, and then... Which area did you live in? I uh, lived in Johannesburg, in Waverley. Which, in Waverley, so Waverley, Waverley was quite a Jewish area. Yes, yes. yeah, yeah. That's right, Waverley Shul was, just was of course... a few uh, steps down the road. So I saw this article in the, I think it was in the Star at the time, about the um, help centre that was downstairs fr from the shul, where it was basically for people like alcoholics and people wanting to commit suicide, but it was a helpline that you could phone and they would, they would help you. And it was written or it was involved with Angela Marcus, about Marcus's wife and I thought well this sounds amazing and she sounds like a real person you know a real mensch so I phoned her up and we were talking and chatting and I must have mentioned somewhere along the line about converting and she said come and talk to my husband and that was it and I, I don't I, you know I'm, he sent the children to the Jewish school and I mean, all sort of he was uh, immediately organising it. This was Rabbi he, Barry Marcus. Yeah. Barry yeah. Marcus, yeah. And when, when you, your name was Helmut at the time, yeah. did he know that you were in the German youth then in the I don't SS? He didn't or? know the he, whole story. He, but he, he, he couldn't right care less. He, he was, he, he liked the look of us. And, uh, I think he, he was, thought that you were genuine. Mm. He, he, yeah, he well, felt... We became... Yeah. We became firm family friends. Yeah. You know, we, we would go there for Pesach and, and our we'd daughter, go there often our, she was our eldest daughter would uh, you know look after their children. Yes. I mean the whole thing sort of developed just like In fact with the one of the 
the youngest child they had, little girl at that time. Um, you, you, you know, I used to look after her a lot. And I remember one time in particular, she stood was on, a, on a Shabbat afternoon, we used to go down for the service in the afternoon, and she was standing right down at the front, you know, on the, by the bimmer, and she suddenly started screaming out, Pam, Pam! Oh, I felt, <laughs> I felt so stupid. <clears throat> and, uh, but we were, we were close friends, you know. It was, um, yeah. And the conversion process, was it a difficult process? Four years. Four years. Yeah. I know, we had it to. was hard. Yeah. But you were also doing an MBA at that time. Yeah. And you were doing the MBA at Vince. Yeah. yeah, at that time yeah. that we were converting, so it was not so simple. Which but we had a lot of Jewish friends. I mean, yeah. And we were even going and helping with the with the wine making for Pesach. Mm. We we had lots of lots of Jewish friends. Yeah. I mean, that's it. You know, it was so friendly. You, you. But it just, you know, when people say, why did you convert? It's not one thing in particular, it's... it's it, be, it was like a process. It was yes. a growing up process. Sort of just... A, a good community. Right. And do you yeah. remember Rabbi Kutzstein that I'm based in? Yes, 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 yes. So he's living in Israel and yeah. he's my patient and I'm oh, in touch with Rabbi <laughs> Kutzak and yeah. I asked him about you yeah. and he remembers signing. Yes. yes. <laughs> he probably you. also remembers the fact that my <laughs> my son, although they'd already had their bris, you have to draw blood. And he was going bananas. He was screaming the place down there, no ways, no ways. So we almost didn't make it. So and they your, talked him your, into your it. Your son and daughter were keen to convert as well? Yeah. 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 And, they were um, fine. So there was uh, Diane Rappaport, Baruch Rappaport. Yeah. And you know who else was one of the AD, one of the witnesses at the conversion? Or who helped you in, in your process? In the process of converting, Rabbi Rappaport wasn't involved in that because we were already <coughs> well and truly married and everything then. No, I, I think it was, wait a minute, yes, 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 I know actually what you're asking me. Who taught us? Um, what's the name of them? Uh, it was a Rabbi Bender, he was involved I also. Wait, 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 wait. My mind's blank. But, but we had three different teachers. We had the the first one that Z Z begins with a Z. He he does the um, Torah Torah writing and the Rabbi Zayden. Rabbi Zayden. We had Rabbi Zayden's wife first of all, yeah. and they were living out in Edenvale at that time, and then after that we had. Um, can see him so clearly. But they were they positive, they were very yes. encouraging. Very, very, very. very. Mm. You know, we were quite friendly with, with the Zaydens and even with the, the other ones, I can't think of the name, he he went over to uh, to America. He lived in in lived in, over near Raglan Street. Over that end, I can't I can't think of their names. Mm. And um, when you did convert, mm. and when you changed your names from Helmut mm. to Yitzhak, and mm. we've got when you changed your name. That was only later. We didn't, although they gave us the names when we got married and under the chuppah, we didn't change our names in a general way until a, f a few years later. Um, I'd always, always said that I would die before I was 63. Um, and I had an operation where I died on the table. And so after that, that's when we started using our Hebrew names. My operation should have been about three or four hours, and it was like over eight hours. Um, and I 
woke up, I mean I went under saying the Shema and I woke up thinking I hadn't said the Wayfarer's Prayer um, and I could hear these people around me this saying by the side of me, they weren't talking about me but I thought they were, just waiting for the sun to come over from from uh, overseas and, and I had this tube down my throat, I couldn't spoke big, I wrote, am I dying? It was terrible. But um, so after that, that's when we started using our Hebrew names. And what happened? How did they revive you? I don't know, I just know they did. <laughs> so, uh, it just, yeah. But you really, you really, <clears throat> at one time, did your yeah. heart stop beating? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And I, I was major. So Rivka, do no, you remember no. What, well, do you have no. any recollections when none you lost all. consciousness or? None at all, none at all. But it's a, a miracle I that just, you survived. I just know that I came to thinking I didn't do the Wayfarer's Prayer. As I said, I went under saying the Shema, because when I have an op, that's what I always do. Um, but, and I say like that when I have an op, because my back, I've had so many operations, but that last one was the... I, I, I was away in the United States. That was one of the first ones. Yeah. It was Ronald Lubner of the, the play class uh, thing, taking over West Coast class in, 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 the, in the States. The Lubners are they yeah. very iconic in South Africa. Yeah, nice. yeah. Lovely, and, lovely family, really. Yeah. And can I ask the when, lady was nice. I think Rivka, when you heard the shofar, that that oh. had a very, that was the mm. moment that really had a tremendous mm. impact mm. On, mm. on on your mm. your neshama on your life. Yeah, yeah. I mm. could sort of, I could almost feel that I was there, sort of like a. a a terrain that was rocky and, and I could almost feel that and it brought tears to my eyes at that time. It was the most amazing experience, mm. really. And Yitzhak, well, what for you and has been one of the most incredible experiences when you converted? Because I think what you've done and they actually mentioned this in the Mishpacha magazine that when you stepped forward to save your squad from the Russians, mm. you felt a sense of mission. Over the years, it gradually became clear that it was a Jewish mission. Yeah. When you converted from being you from being the nation that oppressed, you joined the victims, which is incredible. Mm. What you've mm. done, it's it's unique. Well, you know, I think it was finding out on my, what, what was it, 20th or 21st birthday? 20th, I think. 20th, on my 20th birthday, that uh, the, the birthday of Israel and my birthday were coinciding. I think you were born on Rosh Chodesh, Sivan. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. And I mean, I, I couldn't, I did, didn't know what it implied, but for me, it was a wonderful knowledge because this new Israel miracle kind of state which has sort of suddenly er erupted despite all the horrors of the, of the war. You know, for me, it was a total inspiration. And uh, have you visited Israel? Oh yes, and many times. We were trying to settle in Israel. We even owned, we bought a, we, owned we bought a flat there at one time, but then we had to give it up because it was impossible. We could tell it wasn't going to work how, out. How was your feelings when you actually came to Israel for the first time? Did you feel a connection? A yeah, but oh, very nice. It was uh, I mean, I went on a what was it on a special. Tour. No, no, that was afterwards. That was afterwards. The first time we went there was, oh. was when um, just after Carl was born. Yeah. That was the first time we went on that trip from, from Germany we went over. But 
some of our best South African friends went. Have, co- have gone over. Co- went over. I'm yeah. sure you know the Perezes. Yeah, well, they're, yeah, the Perezes, yeah. they're great friends of ours. It's a very Zionistic community, the yeah. South African Jewish community. Mm. Yeah. And were you embraced into the community? This the first Shabbat that you had in Waverly Shore. Did they make you feel part of Welcome. the community oh, and welcoming? Yeah. 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 Very active. Mm. I mean, I was with the Women's Guild, but as soon as we we joined, we all right. We didn't at first go into the Brockers, but then we were asked, you know, to go in for the Kiddush, because we did. We didn't at first. Uh, I felt at first we were really, you know, be careful, you know, I'm sort of not quite sure where we were and everything. But uh, no, that was very quickly we were. And your your in. your son and daughter, they were, did they feel part of the community? Yeah. Were they accepted? Yeah. 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 I mean, that's, I think Carl's written it at the back of the book there. He's written to say that, you know, um, it was hard at first, but then, you know, he couldn't think of himself after. After a little while, he just thought himself as Jewish, and that's it. And what school did they go to? Uh, they both went to Yeshiva College to start with, and then um, Carl went to uh, King David's. Yeah, King David's afterwards. Because uh, every class he went into, they would say, "Oh, you're Greta's brother. Yo, oh, you're Greta's brother," and they would expect him to do what she was doing, you know, and it's not, they're not the same people. And can I ask, Yitzhak, you know, with the name von Schweitzer or when people heard your accent, did you ever have any negative reactions? People knowing that you were in the German youth or that you were in the SS, did that ever, did you ever feel any Mm. negativity or... Was anybody ever judging you? or? But he never made a big thing of the fact that he was in the SS and all the rest of it. Yeah. That he kept quiet about all that. But obviously from the from the uh, name and the accent, they knew he was Austrian. But and was, that ever, Austrian. was that ever a negative or did you ever feel that you were being judged or was that ever an so. issue? Stop it. Not really. And Rivka... With Look, you, was it, was it ever a problem knowing that your husband was like German or came from German roots? Austrian, you, Austrian. Or Austrian, sorry, Austrian. Or yeah, I made a point of saying that, Austrian. Austrian. Uh, that made a big, big difference. Yeah. yeah. And I, by the time, uh, fairly soon, I had my Austrian passport. Um, that made an enormous psychological now, I have to ask you something which how did your family react because this couldn't have been an easy when they no, heard the news that you had definitely, converted definitely. it must have been a tremendous shock to the system it must have been yeah, but it's my fault oh they, no, they didn't look at it as they accepted it yes but yes. Uh, really it was a point of well it was it's her fault I mean he would never have done that on his own Mm-hmm. And uh, if he'd have married Maria, it wouldn't have happened. You know, she should have. And but no, did, did they did they accept? Did they come to terms? Um, yeah, they did. My, my sister said to me, um, "I know you you're now Jewish, but it, as far as I'm concerned, you're my brother. Don't 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 let mix up your Jewish life with me." And, uh, and she was my closest That's sister person. Rosie. And is she still alive? No. Yes. She, I mean, she, she was the one with that book. That you translated to English for her. Mm-hmm. No, his brothers and sisters, they all died from the youngest up to the oldest. So Yitzhak is the only one you, there. You're the only survivor. Yeah. 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 From the family. So I yeah. collected all the, the the hidden writings and so on from them. Now, I just want to mention, because it's so important, and I am so grateful to Serena Gold, 
Yeah, because she was the one that introduced me to you, and she's been very instrumental in 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 your book. Very. And she sent me the video. She's uh, Dr. Serena Gold. She Mm. was Rabbi Lappin's wife, and she Mm. was very involved with Ketzer Torah. Mm. And you were members of Ketzer Torah as well. Yes. Yes. How come you moved from Waverley to Ketzer Torah? Because of Serena. Serena. Serena was in charge of the ladies' guild. Yeah, that that's at Waverley, but this. We moved over there because of them. And were you we, really we were walking. Um, we used to walk over to the, from Waverley to um, uh, Katerura, and then we'd stop and have lunch at the Lapins on the way home. Um, and then we we moved over there nearer to the to uh, Katerura, and then they moved. <laughs> to and then of course. Uh, Rabbi Lapid started his, uh, what, 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 what did he call them? He would have Shirim on, on a Saturday night, right. on a Monday we Shabbat. Yeah, we and people there. thought yeah. it's never happened in Johannesburg. Yeah. Who would come? People would go to the movies yeah. on a Saturday, who yeah, would come? It was amazing. And, and it was full. And, yes. and, yeah. and it yeah. became a tremendous, not only a hit, but people really wanted to, yeah. they were searching. Yeah. And he was an amazing speaker, and yeah. the topics were yeah. very, and it was always full. It was mm. hard to get a, yeah, a seat. Yeah. If you yeah, didn't yeah. come early enough, yeah. people were standing. Yeah. But you had to be on time. He was very, very particular yes. about that. Very particular. And the community at Ketatura also were very inviting and very hospitable. Very, yeah. very, very. Yeah. But we, we did a lot for Ketatura. We did. Mm. And what made your decision to come to Edgeware? I know, I think your daughter came to England. Yes, well, the family had been nagging us for a long while to leave South Africa because it wasn't safe. They'd all left already. Um, And my daughter was here in Edgeware, so that's why we came to Edgeware. And you've been accepted very well into the community here as well? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Into both, we're at um, at Netsuk. And also at the at the big school, big school as well. And I think what's, United. what's amazing, um, Rivka, is that you are a full time. Look how hard you work as a mashiach, mm. and you work for uh, like a twelve hour day. Yeah, I do. Six days a week. That's Except for Friday, we leave a bit earlier. We don't leave so and late. And you enjoy Friday. what you do. You. I love it. I love it. But I mean, for anybody like the KLBD to take a chance on me at 79 years old, to change my trade completely, because I mean, I was in the, the rag trade. Um, I think that was amazing as well, that they mm. took the chance on me. Um, but it's worked out. It's wonderful. Mm. Now, if I can ask you both, what message do you impart to not only your children, but grandchildren to the future generations. What message do you leave for the, the next generations? Because you've really, it's like you've seen it all. You've been on both sides. I mean, mm. what you've done is unique in this world. There is no one like you. Mm. And Rivka, there's no one like you as well. To marry, you know, to marry um, Helmut, who became Yitzhak, your story is incredible beyond belief. It is... Mm. You both are very unique people and very amazing people. But what, what message do you, can you impart to the future generations? I think it's important that if you're married to somebody, that someone has got to come first and you've got to do things together and really look after each other. I think that's most most important because yeah. your marriage has got to be firm, and I think ours is. Yeah, I mean we disagree sometimes violently about things, mm-hmm. you know. But, but still love him. Rivka has a underneath. personality of her own, and but because we love each other, we can fight it out. You know, in, in a lot of families, you know, certainly when I think of my parents' family, you just didn't talk about it. So, you know, somehow you you carried on, but uh, it it wasn't a true marriage anymore. Mm. 
because it's eating away underneath exactly. whatever the problems and are. You, you start the your own out. separate life. You're, you're not really clear understanding each other. And your decision to convert, was it a joint decision? Yes. Very yeah. much. Yeah. You could never have done it if one would have agreed and the other one didn't agree. Or it would have been very difficult. I don't think we could have done. I think it was, yeah. but it was a joint decision. Yeah. And it's wonderful that your your son and daughter agreed as well, because mm. it's mm. not a given that that the no, children. No, uh, no, no. They but that, at that choice. point, they had a lot of Jewish friends. From they were going to school at H. A. Jacks at that time, and there were a lot of Jewish children there. You know, and Greta was always going off to. Um, Claudia Moe was the one she was going round to, and another. And do I remember that name and the others? But she she was always going round to different friends and staying with them, <laughs> mm. to Jewish families. And your reaction with the Jewish community, with the the rabbinate, with the Beit Din, was it positive? Because it sometimes it can be a very taxing and very difficult process. It's hard. It's hard, but you know it was. It was okay. Yeah. wasn't wasn't that bad yeah. wasn't bad you know they have to put you off to start with that's that's really the thing because they want to see if it's genuine if it's yeah of course, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Um, so i would like to thank rivka and yitzhak von schweitzer there are no words to express my deep and sincere appreciation for meeting you, mm. for this, letting me into your home, mm. and really letting me into your lives, and mm. hearing this most unbelievable and remarkable mm. story. It's unique in the world, and um, I'm just overwhelmed. Mm. Yeah. And um, I think you both are just tremendous heroes, Tremendous. So. You both are just the most remarkable people, really. Mm. And Yitzhak, you are <laughs> just amazing what, mm. you, what you did from to join the, the victims and to become part of the victims. It's just, it's phenomenal. It's, it's, mm. it's just amazing. And it's so special and so unique. Mm. And I'd like to mention something which just happened this last week. Mm. Um, <clears throat> who would have believed when you were fighting the Russians, mm. you were in the SS, that many years later, not too many years, like 80 years later, that the German government would sign a deal with the Jewish people, with the State of Israel, mm. and would ask to have the Arrow 3, which is a very incredible defense system that Israel has now sold to to Germany mm. in order to defend Germany. Mm. Wow. It is something that no one would ever have dreamt no. that no. Germany no. would be asking Israel to give them a weapon to defend themselves. Mm. So amazing. we see how things turn around yeah. and yeah. I think from you being in the Hitler Youth and in the SS becoming Jewish mm. and becoming Orthodox and having two bar mitzvahs Mm. It is, it's just phenomenal beyond belief. Mm. It's the word unreal. There's yeah. just no words. Yeah. So your book, From German War to Jewish Peace, My Life Journey from the Waffen SS to Orthodox Judaism by Yitzhak von Schweitzer, mm. this should be in every single home, mm. not only Jewish, Thank but in every home. I think it is remarkable. And on the cover, mm. you have a picture when you were in the the German youth mm. being part of the British in itself in the British bomb disposal. bomb disposal but wearing a British army yeah, uniform yeah. and then carrying a safer Torah yeah. and having two bar mitzvahs mm. it's, yeah. this is historical this is amazing and our blessing is that you should have all of Hashem's blessings both of you mm. and yeah, I'd yeah. may stream in only very good health Thank and nachas and happiness and I just can't thank you enough and thank Rivka, you. I can't thank, thank you enough you. as well thank you. you yourself are uh, like an amazing story
And well, <laughs> I mean, we've never met anybody quite like you. Well, that's so kind sure. of you. And but no, this sure. has been for me coming to London to to just meet you both. Mm. Uh, they they really it's been so very special. Thank you. And to I just want to wish you both a shana tova. I mean, it, it is that Jewish experience again. I mean, nowhere else in our lives would we have found anybody like you who visit an 97-year-old wow. survivor. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, this right. is the highlight, yeah. and it, it's Thank been you. the biggest honor and privilege. Thank you. No, I, lovely having I think you. It's wonderful. Mm. Thank you, you both so much. You made the effort. Yeah.